Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Science Oxford live streams. My name is Emily. Um, I'm also joined here today by Sarah, by Ian and by Kat. Um, so usually during Science Week, we'd all be really busy coming to see you in your schools, bringing our shows and our workshops, or maybe welcoming you here to our Science Oxford Centre, where you can also go in the exploration zone or out into the woodlands um, and around the ponds. Um, but obviously, because of COVID, we've not been able to do that this year. So instead, we decided to live stream a couple of shows from our Science Oxford Centre to you at school and at home. Uh, now, I know we've got a couple of schools that have joined us today, so I'm going to give you all a quick shout out. Um, so I know we've got Europa School, Rice and Anthony, Great Kimball C of E School, Oakley C of E Combined School, Brill Church of England School, Wotton St Peter's Primary, Bayard Hill Primary, Cuddington and Dinton C of E School, St Joseph's Catholic Primary School, Carterton, the Downley School, Orchard Meadow and Tackley. So welcome everybody. It's a great, great list. So lovely to have you all and I'm sure there's others on board as well. So welcome. We hope you enjoy the next half an hour or so with us. Um, so today we're going to do a couple of different demonstrations. Um, throughout the stream there will be times where I'm going to ask you a question and I'd like you to go away with your class um, and discuss as a class with your teacher. Um, and your teacher should have a little kind of special chat box where they can send us your ideas and you might be able to see already, you can see some of your names and comments appearing on the screen. So you might even see your name and your idea appear throughout the next kind of half an hour or so as well. Now today's theme is the senses. Um, so we as humans have about five main senses. Um, so they are sight, smell, taste, hearing and touch. Now, some of those senses are pretty difficult to explore. We're not in the same place. Um, so for today, we're just going to focus on sight and on hearing. OK, so we'll start off with sight. Now, before we started the stream, uh, we posed you the question, um, have you ever experienced complete darkness? And if so, where were you? So I wonder if anyone has experienced this. So Sophie says she was in a cave and Jacob says in a bathroom with no windows. <gasps> Gosh, Amelia says, in the attic of a house. Fantastic. Ollie says, in the attic. Mason says, he experienced it when he was in his bedroom at night. Matthew, inexperienced in a cave. And he says, Eve has played murder in the dark. Ooh, that sounds spooky. Hopefully not real murder. <laughs> so, excellent. So, some fantastic ideas there. Um, so, I'll tell you what, I, I've had a similar experience as some of you there. So, one of the times where I've experienced complete darkness was when I did go caving. So I put on the big funky looking suit, hard hat with a big old light on the front of my forehead. Um, and I went down with an instructor and a couple of friends into a cave. And as we got quite far in, we said, oh, should we turn off our lights and see what we can see around us, see what, what is in the cave? Um, so we did that, we turned off our lights and we couldn't see a single thing. So there's absolutely no light whatsoever deep down in these caves. Um, so we couldn't see anything. So to be able to see, we obviously use our eyes, and our eyes detect light um, from, uh, um, in the environment around us. So they detect the light in the room. Um, so usually during the daytime, if you're outside, um, we can get our main, our main light source, the place we tend to get light from is the sun. Um, but also if you're inside, we tend to use kind of lights and lamps. Um, you might also, if you're in a dark attic or bedroom, use a torch like this one here. So these all um, tend to shed light on a really wide area so you can see plenty of the stuff in your environment. Um, so with these lights, there are possibly about millions, possibly billions of light rays all traveling from a light source to our environment for us to be able to see. So with this torch here, if I was to shine it on my belly, like a big tully tubby or something, the light is traveling from the torch towards my top and then bouncing off my top for you to be able to see it. And it's only when it bounces off my top and the light rays go into your eye, or in this case, into the camera, um, that we can actually see it. Now, all of these light rays will be traveling in straight lines, a bit like these straws I've got here. So when I first turn on a torch, if you imagine I am the sun or a torch or a lamp and I'm about to shine some light towards you, this is how the light rays travel. They move in straight lines towards you in all different directions. So light always travels in straight lines, but because we tend to shed the light in a wide area, they spread out and are traveling really, really far. So I'd love to prove to you that light does travel in straight lines, but it's quite tricky to do that if we were to use the sun or a torch because of this, because the light rays are gonna move in all different directions. And as soon as they hit something and bounce or reflect 
um, off something. They're going to move in all different directions and it's really difficult to keep track of where those light rays are traveling. So instead what we need isn't a light that does this but is a light that does that. So a type of light that focuses all of the light rays in a single direction so that we can maybe see the way that light is traveling and it's nice and straight. So luckily enough I actually have something that does that. So this is a special type of light. This is a laser light. Um, so if I was to point it on my top here, you can see a much smaller dot starting up here. Okay, so it's only possibly the same size as the hole in the pen. So all the light rays are being focused in the same direction from the pen onto my top and all focusing on this little point here. So when I, when I turn it on, we still at the moment cannot see the way the light is traveling between the pen and my top. But I have got a little trick that will allow us to do that. So I've got a second pen set up over here. So you'll notice I've set it up so it's pointing that way. So laser lights can be quite dangerous. Um, so it's really important we don't um, point them towards our faces because it, it can hurt our eyes. So it's pointing that way at the wall away from all of us. Um, so if I turn it on and I'm going to grab my board to help us see. You might be able to see the red dot, there we go, appear on the blackboard. So we can only see it when the light is traveling over here and it bounces off the board and it bounces all in different directions and bounces into the camera so you can see it. So at the moment we can't see the path of the light but I can do this trick to help us see exactly that. So I would like you to watch really carefully because I'm going to ask you um, a question about why this works afterwards. Okay, so have a look. So hopefully now you can see the laser light. So the path the light is traveling, it is a straight line. So we can prove that using the laser because they're all traveling in the same direction. But why does it only work when I sprinkle the talc in the way and not, not now? Why, doesn't it, why does it work only with the talc? So I'm going to ask you that question for the first question. So I'd like you to go away with your class and discuss together um, and feed your ideas and your um, answers to your teacher who will be able to send them to us in the chat and I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes time.
Hello everybody, welcome back. So let's just recap what we just did. So I've got the laser turned on, which we can only currently see when the light bounces off my hand. Um, and we could only see the light path, so the straight line when we sprinkled talcum powder in the way. But why was this? Let's have a look at some of your answers. So Jensen says, oh sorry, I've gone past that. Uh, the talc touches the laser, which allows it to be seen. Oh, so you reckon it touches the light ray. Uh, we think the light needs to come into contact with an object and it bounces off of that, fantastic. Uh, because the light reflects off the dust. Excellent word, here you go, very impressed. Uh, Jensen says, when she put the powder, the light had something to reflect off. Again, excellent word. Then there was no powder and there was nothing to reflect off and the class agrees. I'll tell you what, excellent, very well. Uh, I love the terminology you're using. So we can talk through, my camera's come back, there we go. Sorry, I went out of focus then for a minute. I can talk us through what happened. So some of you are spot on, I'm very impressed. So we had the laser light, all the light rays were traveling in this direction towards the wall, weren't they? And it was only when we sprinkled the dust, the kind of talcum powder or something in the way that we could see the light. Um, and you're right, as the light was traveling, um, it was only when some of the light rays got interrupted and hit the dust particles, they jetted off in a different direction and some of them came towards the camera so you could see them. So the, the light path was interrupted and some of the light rays reflected, excellent words, and bounced into your eyes so you could see them, which is quite cool. Um, so it's not just kind of air, dusty particles in the air that we can use to look at this. Um, so behind this board, I've now got a tank of water, which you might be able to see behind some of the comments. So I'll bring the tank of water forward slightly because this tank of water is slightly cloudy. We've got some kind of cleaning liquid um, in it. So it's a, a bit similar to the talc that we dusted in the air. But instead of dust being in the air, we've got kind of dustiness in the water. So if I was to grab my laser pen, we might be able to see the line of the laser through it. And I've also got in the bottom of this tank, I've got some mirrors. So some materials reflect light better than others. And mirrors are spectacular at reflecting light. That's why you can see your reflection in it because it reflects the light so well from our faces and everything we can see um, that you can see a copy of yourself in it. So if I was to point the laser down that you can see how well that reflects off of the mirrors on the bottom of the tank. And sometimes if I'm really lucky, I can get a couple of zigzags. So you might be able to see it's bouncing off the bottom of the tank to the top of the water. And I think as I moved it, if the water is really still, um, it reflects off the top of the water back into the tank and you can zigzag it all the way down. So if you've got a teacher who has a laser pen or an, and a tank like this, I'd recommend having a go. But do make sure you've got someone with you um, and you don't point it towards your face because it can do some harm. Fabulous. So we thought about um, sight. So we know that to be able to see, our eyes need light um, to detect in the environment around us. And that light is traveling in straight lines, hitting and um, reflecting off of everything around us um, before it hits our eyes and we can see the, everything in our environment. Okay, so now let's move on to sounds and how we hear. So to create a sound, uh, we need to make something wobble or vibrate. So I reckon one of the easiest things to look at when we're thinking about sounds is musical instruments, right? So I've got a very sophisticated instrument. Uh, not, I'm, I'm gonna claim not the only one I can play, but I'm not sure. I've got a triangle. So let's have a look at what happens when I hit the triangle to play it. So to create a sound of the triangle, I have to use the beta to hit the triangle and then the triangle, the whole of the metal um, kind of structure starts to wobble and vibrate to create the sound. So this isn't just true for the, the nimble little triangle. Um, it's, it might be true for other instruments as well. So I've got three more instruments here I'd like us to think about. So here I have a glockenspiel. You might be able to hear this on my microphone. I've also got a drum over here. And I've got our recorder. See the best tune I can play. So I've got three instruments here and I'd like you to have a think about each of these instruments and try and figure out 
which parts of the instruments might, might vibrate or cause some vibrations to create the sounds that we just heard. So the glockenspiel, the drum and the corder, you can pick one of those, or if you're feeling confident, all three, and see if you can identify what vibrates um, to create the sound. So we'll give you another two more minutes to go and discuss that with your class, and I'll see you shortly. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your discussions with your class. So what did we think about these instruments and what parts of them vibrate? So for the drum, we think the top of the stick vibrates something inside the drum. Interesting. So Henry says the recorder, the air is vibrating. Fantastic. Uh, we think that the part being hit or blown is the part that vibrates. Uh, Milo and Finn say that the recorder, you blow into the tube and it vibrates out the hole. So I wonder if you played the recorder before, Milo, and you thought about how it might work. Good one. Uh, the vibrations echo in the hollow spaces of the instruments. Ooh, very well thought out. Okay, so I'll tell you what, I'll go through uh, each one of these individually. So with the glockenspiel, I wonder if people thought about this one. So when we use the beta to hit the glockenspiel, it's very similar to the triangle. So we start to make those metal keys vibrate. So as they vibrate, they can create a noise. Um, so, we, so we could hear some of these keys are slightly different notes, aren't they? So depending on the length of the key, um, it will give you a slightly different note. So Chestnut say they are all vibrating in different ways. The glockenspiel, the metal drum, uh, and the leather of the drum. Ooh, I like it. Thank you, Miss Henderson. So with the glockenspiel, uh, we've got keys of different lengths. So if I was to hit this longest one here, and it sounds like this, compared to the shortest one, they do sound quite different, don't they? So when I hit the longest bar, it's got to pass the, the vibrations through the whole of that tube and it takes quite a while. So the vibrations can be quite slow. Uh, whereas when I hit the smallest one, the vibrations have only got a very small, place, uh, small space to cover. So the vibrations can actually go through the whole thing quite quickly, which is why they sound different. Um, so some of you I reckon I've seen have thought about the drum. So when we're hitting the drum, uh, you're right, we've got to pass those vibrations onto this top bit of the drum, and that's the skin. Um, so you pass vibrations onto the skin of the drum, but also 
inside the drum, I think someone mentioned this, inside the drum is a load of air. So the vibrations uh, start off at the skin of the drum on top, they pass through the air and they squash and compress the air inside. And it also kind of uh, makes the bottom skin vibrate of the drum too, which is why drums kind of sm uh, smell, no they don't, they sound a bit kind of boomy, don't they? Compared to the glockenspiel, it kind of sounds a bit um, so it's vibrating the air inside and it's almost kind of making it echo, isn't it? Lovely. And last but not least, the recorder. So quite a few of you have tried to tackle uh, thinking about the recorder. This, I think, is the most complicated one because it's not the, um, the, uh, the instrument itself that vibrates. Some of you have figured out that it is the air. So when you, uh, when you play the recorder, you blow through the, the mouthpiece, don't you? So if I come to uh, this, the close-up cam here, we first blow into the mouthpiece here. Um, and it travels through the front of the recorder and it's either got two places to go when it reaches this point. There is either a hole at the front here or the rest of the recorder it can travel through. And basically the air doesn't know which way to go. Um, it kind of flips between both. It goes out the top, in the bottom, out the top, in the bottom, like it, and it starts to vibrate. So the air vibrates. So you, some of you have already clocked this. The air is the thing that is vibrating in a recorder and it vibrates between coming out and staying in the recorder. And we can change the, the sound the recorder makes by covering up the hole. So again, I think I saw some comments about changing what it sounds like with the hole. So if I cover up all the holes and keep loads of air inside the recorder, it sounds like that. But if I let some of the air out, so there's less stuff inside, less air inside the recorder, it sounds like this. So you get a, a kind of you get more air inside if you cover up the holes, but less air, kind of more air escaping um, to get a higher sound in the recorder. So well done to those of you who clocked that one, because even I was, was uh, struggling to find, figure out that when I first thought about a recorder. So fantastic observation if you figured that one out. OK, so we know now that to be able to hear something, we need to hear some sounds and that sounds are caused by vibrations or things wobbling. So these vibrations can be passed to almost everything um, around us. So whether it's uh, made of uh, air, so gases, or liquids, or solids. So each one of these things, we can um, allow sounds to travel through. Now, we know ga uh, gases and air can make uh, allow sound to travel because you can hear me speaking now. So at the moment, uh, I'm speaking to you. I'm pushing air out of my lungs and past my vocal cords, and my vocal cords are vibrating. They're making the air inside my mouth and in front of my mouth vibrate. And those vibrations are passing on to the microphones or to the people in the room. And so with the microphones on, on, our, on our tech here, it sends an electric, electrical signal to your computer and tells your computer to vibrate the speakers in the same way my voice is, which is pretty clever. Um, so we know that sounds can travel through gases. Um, before I talk about liquids and solids, I'd like to find out if you think you've um, experienced sounds that have travelled through either of these. So here's my next question for you. Do you think you've ever experienced um, sounds that have travelled through a liquid or a solid? Um, and if so, can you tell us what that was? And um, so we'll give you another two minutes to think about this question and, and where you might have been or what you might have been doing um, to have heard a sound that has travelled through a liquid or a solid. Off you go.
Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your discussion. Um, so we've already got a comment on knocking on a door is a good idea of when um, vibrations can travel through a solid, when you're swimming, as an example of being um, sounds traveling through liquids. Uh, swimming, bang, when, when he banged a wood and tore with a hammer. Fantastic. So again, you're, you're um, hitting a, a solid thing and it's passing vibrations, aren't we? We made cups with string, we could hear the vibrations turning into sound. Fantastic. Yeah, so when you make those cups, uh, two cups on either end and a string through the middle and you can pass vibrations through them. Excellent. So sound can travel through gases, liquids and solids. And I've seen some excellent examples there. So some people saying when they've been in the swimming pool. Um, so yeah, if you've ever been in the swimming pool and kind of gone underwater and gone, ah, to your friend, you can hear each other, can't you? Obviously, you don't want to inhale any water, but you can you can hear those sounds in a swimming pool. Um, you can also, if you've ever um, sat in the bath um, and you sat with your head above the water, if, you, if you've not tried this, I'd recommend it. Sit in the bath and tap on the side of the bath and you'll be able to hear the vibrations in the solid bath um, and the vibrations pass through the air to your ear so you can hear them. But then also dip one ear under the water and tap under the water against the bath. So you're tapping the solid bath and the sound will travel through the liquid water to your ear. So you should notice a slight difference in those two things. I'm all, I can also show you we can pass vibrations through liquid uh, with this demo here. So I've got one of these things. Does any, I wonder if anyone knows or has a musician in the family who's a musician. Um, so this is a tuning fork. You might have seen it before. The way these things work is you hold it at the, the pointy end here, you strike it against the table and it starts to vibrate. Um, so musicians use this to help tune to a specific note with their instruments. So if your guitar sounds a bit off, um, you can use one of these things, play it and tune your instruments so that it plays the same sound. So this, I wonder if anyone can identify the note. Any guesses? So this is a D. I didn't know that. Some of you might have done. You might have a more, more of a musical ear than I do. So I can uh, pass on these vibrations or amplify them in a different way. So I can use this little pot of water to pass on the vibrations of my solid tuning fork into the liquid and hopefully we might see the effect that has. So here we go. If I strike my tuning fork. Oh, <laughs> all over my face. <laughs> Lovely. Let's go one more time. <laughs> Great. So you can see that those vibrations can start or be transmitted from a solid into a liquid and splash me in the face as well. So we can send sounds through all these different um, uh, states or materials. So with this idea, uh, we can come on to the final trick over here. Um, so this is a Rubens tube. Um, and what we're going to try and do with the Rubens tube is show us what shape sound uh, might kind of travel in. So this is a hollow tube with lots of holes um, drilled in the top and there's a speaker attached in one end over here. So I'm going to play some sounds through the Rubens tube and we're going to create some fire in the shape of the sound waves coming out the top. Now some of you uh, may have been with us for um, our live stream earlier in the week, the Fantastic Fire one. Um, so you might know uh, what we need to start a fire. There are three things if you remember rightly. So we need fuel, a source of heat, and we need um, some air, the oxygen in the air. So what I've got down here behind the desk is um, a gas canister. It's going to give us some fuel. So we're going to have some gas fuel pumped inside this um, container here. I've got a lighter over here that is going to be my source of heat. And then it's only going to be through these little holes and along the top that we're going to get the flames up here because there's only oxygen in the room around us here. There's not really any, well, there's not much inside the tube. OK, so hopefully we should be able to see what happens when I turn this on. So I need to pump in some gas. Oop. So we've got our fuel. Fuel is being pumped in. Oh, there we go. I'm just going to adjust it to just the right amount. Which I think is about here. So you might see it's kind of wobbling already. So we've connected it to the stream. So this is actually the sound of my voice, uh, which is quite cool. 
I'm trying to pause it one second so it doesn't distract you too much. So we're going to play some different sounds through the Rubens tube, and now it's ready to go. Um, first of all, we're going to play um, two kind of kind of single sounds. So we're going to play a sound that is um, a kind of low pitch, so something that makes the speaker vibrate quite slowly to create a low sound. And then we're going to um, play a sound that is a high pitch, so one that makes the speaker move much, much quicker um, to see if it makes any difference with the flame. Okay, so let's have a look. <laughs> So I think there we saw kind of one kind of arc. So it was like two arcs, one there dipped in the middle and kind of came out again, didn't it? So that was the low pitch. So the, the speaker vibrating quite slow. Let's have a look at a high pitch. So when the speaker vibrates a bit, bit faster. Ooh. So this time we saw kind of four peaks, didn't we? So the, the speaker is vibrating much quicker with a high pitch. So as it does that, it makes the fuel inside vibrate and it compresses it together. So as it compresses the gas together, it pushes more of it out, which is why we get the taller bits. So that helps to represent what is happening with the vibrations inside. Where it vibrates, it pushes gas out the top. Now, we will do um, one or two more things with the um, Rubens tube. Uh, we're going to give you some time to think about um, any questions you might have before we finish up the stream. Um, so what we're going to do is I'll give you some time to think about some questions you might have. We'll play um, a song through the Rubens tube for you to enjoy whilst you're doing that. Then we'll come back, answer some of your questions. Uh, and then I've got a question to leave you with. Um, for the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend, if you like, um, before we go. Okay, so I'll play a song through this. Have a little chat with your class about any questions you might have we'd like to send in, and I'll catch you in a few minutes. So here we go. <laughs> So hopefully I have given you a little bit of time to send in any questions you might like to ask us. Um, so Sam wonders why the triangle has a gap in it. Good observation tri uh, there, Sam. So we'd had the triangle, I'll bring it over here and not put it over the flame, it might get a bit hot. 
So we did have a triangle that has a little gap in it. So interestingly, you can have triangles that have gaps or you can have ones that are complete. Um, so I think if you have one that is open, depending on where you hit it, you might be able to change the sound, sound slightly. So if you hit it near the bit where there is a gap, compared to the bit where you're in the middle, I think it sounds slightly different. Um, whereas if you have one that is complete with no gaps, it should just be the same sound wherever you hit it. So I think that's right for you there, Sam. So well observed. I, I didn't even think about that question. So Molly wonders, what would happen if you screamed into the tube? I tell you what, do you want me to try it? So if I turn my voice back on and go, ah! So a bit loud. How about if I go, oh, oh that was quite good. I'm rest of that. <laughs> so I guess it depends on the pitch of your voice. So when you have um, high sounds and it vibrates really quickly, um, it might struggle to get the gas vibrating quite as quick as your voice is. Um, but if it vibrates slowly like this, oh, I'll try and do some yodeling or throat singing. <laughs> I can't do that. So if you go slowly, I think it's easier to vibrate the gas at the same amount. So oh, there we go, I'll go again. Oh. <laughs> Maddie asks, do louder sounds make the flames go higher? Oh, interesting idea. I'll tell you what, um, we'll play the high pitched sound again. So I'll be quiet in a minute. We'll play the high pitched sound and we'll get Ian, who's controlling the sound, to make it louder or quieter. So here we go. So if we go again, I think the camera froze, Ian. So if it's really loud, I'll turn this off, it's too distracting for me. If it's really loud, the vibrations are really strong. So it pushes the gas together really, really strong inside and you get a really tall flame. So if it's louder, the flames get higher in the same shape they should be. Um, if it's quieter um, and the, the vibrations are a bit more gentle, the vibrations aren't quite as um, strong, so it only pushes a small amount of gas out the top, so it doesn't necessarily change too much. So good idea there, well, well thought through. Do we have any other questions? So Ava wonders why the top of the flame sometimes, sometimes separates, so where it kind of suddenly gets a gap in it. So I think that's where there's um, so much um, force from the speaker vibrating and it pushes out loads of gas from one side um, that it put, almost puts out. Uh, there's, not, there's not as much gas in the gap. So if we were to play the song and suddenly uh, it pushes it really, really strong, I think at this end it pushes it quite strong. We end up with gaps over here. So it pushes more gas out of here and there's less to push down here because the connection for the gas is this end. So if you push more out, at this front bit here it hasn't quite got enough down here to send out gas for the flame here um, but you'll notice it does pick itself back up again so the gas is continually flowing into the tube um, to keep the fire going so it does pick itself back up again but it is quite cool when it suddenly goes <laughs> and again which is quite nice that's that's Sarah's favorite bit as well I know <laughs> Enzo says if you whisper will it move at all I'll tell you what should we try Enzo hello Enzo can you hear me Getting some feedback. Hello, Enzo. Can you hear me? Only slightly. So I guess it depends on the volume we put in or what I say. If I say Kat's favourite phrase, which is Peter Piper picked a peck of peppers, which I think I said right, <laughs> then that's quite good. Uh, okay, let's go for. for an so I think we do have one time. One more question. If we don't quite fit, uh, get to your question today, we might be able to answer them later on. Um, but also, if you actually fancy um, doing some more stuff on sound, um, there is a really good set of, video, uh, set of videos on the BBC website. So if you look up the world of sound, um, there is Fran Scott and Greg Foote who have done some videos. You might recognise some of the instruments and demos that we've done, but they've done loads more and looked at even more instruments on how they work. So if you quite liked these demos, I'd recommend going and checking out those videos as an extra thing for you to do. Um, but other than that, 
I think that almost brings us to the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you with one question to think about, and then we're going to play, um, play us out with the Rubens tube because it's great fun. So the question I have for you uh, to finish off our Science Week streams is this. What are the similarities and differences between light and sound? So what are the similarities and differences between light and sound? So you can go away and have a think about this with your class, with your family, with someone in the supermarket if you really wanted to, whilst you're at the checkout. Whoever is happy to have this conversation with you, what do you think? Uh, what are the differences or similarities between light and sound? So if you've got an idea of what you think the answer could be, we'd love to hear about it. So you can find us on social media or you can email us. And also, because if we're nearly at the end of Science Week, we'd also love to find out how you have all been celebrating British Science Week this year. Um, so if you've got any uh, videos or anything you'd like to tell us about, we'd love to find out how you've celebrated this week as well as joining us on the live streams. Okay, so I'll leave you with that question and I'm gonna turn the Rubens tube back on to play us out. We can all have a little bit of a dance and a boogie. Um, and hopefully we'll maybe see you in your school or at the Science Oxford Centre um, sometime soon. So thank you very much for joining us and I'll catch you later.